Eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis or EGPA is a very rare vasculitis that can cause debilitating health outcomes. In this lesson, we're going to talk about some of the pathogenesis of this condition, signs and symptoms, how we make the diagnosis, and what we can do to treat it. So again, EGPA is a vasculitis. It's also known as Churg-Strauss syndrome. It is a multi-system disorder. It affects many, many different organs. We're going to talk about what those organs are in a moment. So it's a multi-system disorder causing granulomatous inflammation of both small and medium-sized vessels or small and medium-sized arteries. So because it affects small and medium-sized arteries, that's why it's multi-system. Wherever there are small and medium-sized arteries, that's where it's going to affect. And what is key to this condition is hyper eosinophilia, so very high levels of eosinophils, with infiltration of those eosinophils into different tissues in the body. So it causes a variable clinical presentation. It can cause anything from allergic rhinitis or asthma to even myocarditis and pericarditis. So a lot of things can occur with this condition just because of its widespread multi-system effects. So the epidemiology of this condition is that it has an onset in the 20s to 40s. The mean age of on onset seems to be around the age of 40, but there are various stages of this condition that occur even earlier than that. And what is the etiology? A lot of times it seems to be hereditary. There is some genetic component. There seems to be an autoimmune component to this condition. And then there's also associations with certain medications. And the one I want to talk about here is leukotriene receptor antagonists or medications with the suffix leucast. So you can think of Monte leucast or Singular. These leukotriene receptor antagonists are actually asthma medications, and they can be used to treat asthma, but they can actually increase the risk for Churg-Strauss. Other medications that can increase the risk for Churg-Strauss syndrome include medications like steroids and cocaine. So I talked about this before. There are certain stages of eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis. Those stages are, the first one is a prodromal stage. This generally occurs in patients in their 20s and 30s. They present with atopic disease. And atopic disease, you can think of the atopic triad. Allergic rhinitis is one of them, and asthma is the other one. Those are the two big ones that you're going to see with this prodromal stage. So runny nose, asthma, like wheezing, shortness of breath, those types of signs and symptoms. The next stage is known as the eosinophilic stage. And as its name implies, we get hyper eosinophilia, increased eosinophil count. And this is when organs begin to become unhappy. The high, high amounts of eosinophils begin to infiltrate organs leading to granulomatous inflammation. And the most common, a lot of times you see the lungs, you see the gastrointestinal tract being infiltrated, you can see the skin being infiltrated, many different organ systems. We're going to talk about a variety of symptoms that we can see with this condition in the next couple of slides. The third stage of this condition is the vasculitic stage. The vasculitic stage is in the 30s to 40s. So the eosinophilic stage is kind of in between the prodromal stage and the vasculitic stage. It could occur maybe in the 30s. The vasculitic stage occurs a bit later, 30s, 40s. Remember, the mean age of onset is around 40. So the vasculitic stage is when we start to see this granulomatous inflammation really start to happen. And this is when we start seeing small and medium-sized vessels being affected. This is when we start to see many of our signs and symptoms we're going to talk about next. And we also begin to see constitutional symptoms as well. So there is a classic triad of Churg-Strauss syndrome or EGPA. The classic triad is the following. One is asthma and or allergic rhinitis. So that is a very key classic component of this condition. The other one is eosinophilic lung disease that presents similarly to pneumonia. We're going to talk a bit more about that later. There are certain pulmonary infiltrates or opacities that occur. And the third part of the triad is systemic vasculitis. So systemic vasculitis, we might see anything from mononeuritis multiplex, peripheral neuropathy, and you might also see peripheral eosinophilia, so high eosinophil counts. And you might see this in blood work. You might see this in signs and symptoms like in skin lesions that we'll talk about in the next couple of slides. 
So what are some of those other clinical features? There are a variety of different clinical features with this condition because it affects small and medium-sized vessels. So it can affect many different systems in the body. The first one I wanna talk about is the lung involvement. This is the most common organ that is involved. It causes asthma. We see pulmonary opacities on imaging like we showed earlier. And we can even see pleural effusions and the pleural effusions contain eosinophils. So lung involvement is a key component of this condition. Another key component is issues with the ears, nose, and throat. So we talked about allergic rhinitis, but we can also see otitis media. So where you can see here, this is otitis media. The tympanic membrane is bulging. There's fluid in behind there. Again, the allergic rhinitis. You can also see recurrent sinusitis. So recurrent sinus infections can occur with this as well. So recurrent ear infections, rhinitis, recurrent sinusitis, all are common with this. You can also see nasal polyps. So you can see little polyps in the nasal canal. There are many other clinical features. We talked about this earlier. Peripheral neuropathy is one. This is also very common. Three quarters of patients seem to have peripheral neuropathy with this condition. We can see eosinophilic gastroenteritis. This causes abdominal pain, hematochesia, melina, so GI bleeds, diarrhea. There's also cardiac involvement. This is probably the most significant cause of mortality. It can lead to pericarditis. You might also see myocarditis as well. There is also skin involvement. So the integumentary system is probably the second or third most common system that is affected in this condition. We can see palpable nodules that are often tender. So here is a palpable nodule. And we can also see other skin lesions. So kind of macules and patches. And I mentioned this before, there's constitutional symptoms, especially in the third phase of this condition. So constitutional symptoms, especially occurring in the vasculitic phase, and this includes fever and weight loss and fatigue. So how do we make the diagnosis and what can we do to treat this condition? So the diagnosis, we have to suspect this condition in the first place. This is a very rare condition. So we want to suspect the condition if there are clinical features of it. So the patient is atopic, they have asthma, allergic rhinitis. They also have a high eosinophil count, usually greater than 1,500 per microliter or greater than 10% of total leukocyte count are eosinophils. Then you that'll kind of catch your eye and you can think about this condition. And then oftentimes we even see higher levels of eosinophils with this condition. So we want to peak our interest when we see greater than 1,500, but a lot of times we might even see 5,000 to 9,000 per microliter. And we might also see ANCA positive. So ANCA is not entirely sensitive or specific for this condition, but if we do see ANCA positive, majority are P-ANCA. And the American College of Rheumatology has developed a criteria for diagnosis of this condition. So we need four or more of the following six in order to make a conclusive diagnosis of eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis. So the first criteria is having asthma. The second criteria is having greater than 10% eosinophils. The third criteria is mononeuropathy or polyneuropathy. The fourth criteria is pulmonary opacities that are either migratory or transient. So a lot of times you might see these pulmonary opacities on chest x-ray and then you check it again and they've actually moved or they're gone or they come back. So we might see this with eosinophilic granulomatosis polyangitis. The fifth is paranasal sinus abnormalities. We talked about this before, recurrent sinusitis. And the sixth is actually taking a biopsy of a blood vessel and showing accumulations of eosinophils. This is going to be essentially, in a lot of ways, a gold standard test for this condition. So these are the six criteria. We need four or more of them to make a conclusive diagnosis according to the American College of Rheumatology. Once you make the diagnosis, how do we treat it? Treatment involves Systemic glucocorticoids. This is the first line therapy. A lot of times patients will recover and go into remission with this condition. If the condition is severe, if there's many, many organs that are involved, we might have to add cyclophosphamide. Almost majority of the time, these two at least will cause a remission of this condition. And this condition is a chronic condition. We have to use maintenance therapy after using the glucocorticoids and cyclophosphamide. We need to use maintenance immunomodulators like azathioprine or methotrexate. So those are the medications we need to use. So again, what I want you to take from this slide is that diagnosis of this condition is 
very difficult in a lot of ways. There's a lot of clinical variety with this condition. There's a variable presentation. But what I really want you to think about is if the patient is asthmatic, they have allergic rhinitis, they have some of those other symptoms I talked about earlier, but also have very, very high eosinophil counts. You want to think about this condition. And then go through the ACR criteria. If you see four or more of those criteria, that's the diagnosis. And then treatment involves first systemic glucocorticoids, then cyclophosphamide if it's a very severe condition. Once they go into remission, we need to use maintenance therapy like azathioprine or methotrexate. So if you want to learn more about other rheumatological conditions, please check out my rheumatology playlist. And if you haven't already, please consider liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell to help support the channel and stay up to date on future lessons. And as always, thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.